All right, welcome to day one of Beyond Labs. I'm excited to embark on the Beyond Labs adventure. I think it's a pretty impressive piece of software. Before I move on to that, I want to um, walk you through how we get there and how you'll be turning everything in now that we're in that Beyond Labs part of the class. So because everything has transitioned 200% online, um, you know, I had to just had to reorganize the website a little bit better because it wasn't intended to be to be swamped with so much online content. And so now I've broken it into portions. I hope this makes it more user friendly for you. So I urge you to kind of explore, take some time to explore the navigation bar that's been more customized so that now everything's on separate pages, um, depending on what you're looking for. So you don't have to sift through lots of lecture material if you're trying to find lab material and so on. And so I hope that works out to be easier. Um, but I promise everything's still there. I'm sorry if it's an inconvenience at first, but I think it'll work out for the better. So now I'm gonna go to um, online labs. And so notice what we have here is we have these little module sections that can be sort of compressed and you can pick and choose which one you're gonna look at. If we tried to look at the later weeks, it's going to be grayed out. You're not gonna be able to do it but um, today's has two components. So once again, if you look at the labs inside, um, it doesn't look great out for me simply because um, the administrator of the site, and that's how I'm logged in, but you'll notice it says un will unlock later. So when you look at it, it should be gray and you won't have an active link until the week you're actually supposed to be doing the lab. So you don't need to worry about those until later. Um, let's go back to today's lab activity one. So there's going to be an assignment sheet that kind of highlights what we're supposed to do that day. Uh, and then the quiz for when you're completely done, you return here and, um, you know, f fulfill the quiz requirement. So you're going to submit that. Now notice um, the sheet, you start here and then you go do what you're supposed to do in the Beyond Lab software. Then you come back home here and enter in your final report, which which is submitted in the form of a quiz with different fields. Some of them will be uh, multiple choice answers on concepts, uh, cut and paste things from your lab notebook from Beyond Labs, uh, write a little conclusion based on all um, everything you've uh, observed and um, information you've analyzed and data you've collected uh, based on similar lab reports in the past. Okay, so let's click on the first uh, page, which is our introduction page. And when that loads, you'll see it says, hey, watch the pre-lab video. That's what we're doing now. It doesn't have anything there because we're actually making it right now. <laughs> so um, kind of metaphysical there, right? But yeah, we're when you um, return here with me, um, you're going to see a link there to watch that. And then um, once this is over, you're gonna kind of, or you know, you can kind of do it simultaneous, open the Beyond Labs client. So I'll show you a walkthrough. For this first experiment, it'll the rest will be very similar, um, just different reactions based on what we're covering in lecture. So because we just finished the Alkenes lecture, hopefully you've watched that part one, uh, then you're going to have the material needed to understand what goes on in alkene hydration. If you haven't watched the part one, um, stop this, take a little break, and go watch at least the first half of the lecture. Um, then that will get you through uh, sort of the reaction background you need to understand how to do an alkene hydration. So you're going to do what's called alkene hydration 3. Pay attention to the title because there's more than one alkene hydration offered. The whole class is going to do alkene hydration 3 this time. And you're going to use the worksheet like a lab manual. So it has the instructions for you. And so you'll follow the instructions for each step. And once again, I'm going to walk you through that in just a minute. Um, but that's going to be the same for future weeks. And then just some reminders, don't forget while you're doing it so you don't have to redo the experiment. Take notes in your virtual lab notebook and don't forget to save. I've had them lost on me as I've experimented with this. Um, you'll wanna screenshot your TLCs and save them. It'll actually post them in your lab notebook. Screenshot and save your IRs just so you, to avoid having to redo anything. It'll also ask you to do an NMR. You would wanna screenshot and save those as well, but today you're not doing that. I'm gonna ask you to skip that because we're covering the, the theory of IR, NMR excuse me, next week. When you're done with the experiment, you return here to take the quiz. Notice there's a next here. That'll prompt you to start the quiz. That's where you answer your post-lab questions and upload all your data. So let's click on the next so we know what's required for the quiz. 
Okay, so this is the place to answer post lab questions and submit your report. Okay, so um, let's go through it and notice question one. So you're gonna open your lab notebook and you'll want to actually um, have all of this information already filled out in your lab notebook when you're done with the experiment. So why are we looking at this now when you're supposed to be done with the experiment before you fill it out? You come back and fill this in, so you wanna know what you're looking for. So I actually recommend selecting all of this, copying it so that it's on your, it'll be on your clipboard, and uh, then when you go into the lab notebook, it'll be saved on your clipboard to paste. So I'll demonstrate that. So the rest you can answer afterward, but I would copy all of that text. Um, and then you have to fill it out in your lab notebook. And then when you return back here, um, you will have all of this information. Some of it you could type now, um, but the synthetic target, the reagents you use, the reaction start time, and all that stuff will be done throughout the lab experience. Okay, so I recommend you kind of look through the quiz that uh, you're going to submit at the end, just so you don't miss anything along the way. Um, it's common to probably have to redo the experiment a couple times, especially the first time through. Uh, they don't take very long once you get the hang of it. Um, so, but to avoid unnecessary redos, maybe look at the quiz and take note of what you're going to be asked to collect so that you don't miss that along the way. So for example, you're asked to upload your TLC snap sh screenshot and your IR screenshot, and you don't want to lose those along the way. And the only way to get them back if they're lost is to just start the experiment again. I've had to do it, so uh, that's why I know that. So I'm gonna um, take a video of the experiment now. Okay, so now here's a video of my computer desktop because the Beyond Labs will not load on a tablet. So um, make sure you have it installed. And the only thing, just to avoid a lot of extra um, unnecessary space wasted on my hard drive, I have avoided downloading everything on here unless you're really interested. Um, I have organic chemistry installed, so that's a sign that you've installed it correctly. It's ready to open. So you can click open, and you'll notice that a purple um, icon will show up in the, the um, dock if you have a Mac. Um, so that's open. And then this is still that little window that shows up for my um, that I started with, the lab client window. So this is the organic chemistry specific window, and this is the overall lab client so we are, we already clicked open this purple one, which is the organic color, um, but you need the worksheet before you're ready to do the lab. So the worksheet, uh, we're going to do alkene hydration. You're assigned alkene hydration three. So that's what that one looks like. And to make sure you're doing the right one, it should read that you are synthesizing one methyl cyclohexanol. So that's what you're going to make in lab. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, since you're doing alkene hydration three, Today, I am gonna do alkene hydration two, just to make sure it's not totally spoiled. I want all the fun for your own discovery. Uh, so here's the hydration procedure. It's practically the same, except today I will make two hexanol, and you are gonna make um, the one methyl cyclohexanol. Okay, so now it's the same reaction that we've done in lecture. So once again, refer to that if you're unclear, but you have to know, uh, you have to use your brain right away to predict what starting materials. So you don't even know it to grab off the shelf unless you know what could make 2-hexanol. So knowing that it comes from an alkene and my parent is hexane, then it used to probably be a hexene. And so they keep it a little simpler for you. You don't have to know from scratch simply, but that is something we would want to be able to do. So cyclohexanol, used to come from a hexene, and since it's at the two position, that means the alkene was either between two and three or one and two. So could it, we could use one hexene or two hexene. So let's see what we have available. So remember we're doing alkene hydration two. Now we're gonna go, that was from our worksheet that I just loaded. Now we're gonna go to the lab, the purple icon, so this, was, this came from the blue one. So just in case you forget how I got here, I got it from Beyond Labs, Alkene Hydration 2. Notice I'm clicked on the Worksheets tab, not the Labs tab. So Worksheets tab, Alkene Hydration 2. Now I have my worksheet ready to go through. That's basically my instructions, my lab manual. Now I'm gonna go find the matching one in the lab client so it knows to set that up for me. Alkene Hydration 2. That just moved on me, where'd it go? Alkene Hydration 2. So you're going to be doing three today, so I'm going to do two today. 
because that matches my worksheet I opened. Now it's loading the synthesis that makes sure that everything is in stock and for, as far as the chemicals go. Uh, look how beautiful that is. It's a nice little uh, synthetic environment there. Makes me miss the real lab, but this is nice that we can get this close to it. So I'm just gonna drag the window open to fill most of the screen. I wanna observe a few things around here. So notice we have the exit, we have a clock. Do we have a back shelf? The back shelf has all of the possible starting materials and they will change depending on what we had clicked on before we entered here. Because I told it we wanna do a alkene hydration, notice that this is highlighted. These are the possible starting materials that should show up on the shelf. These are starting alkenes. Remember that we made a mental note that since I am making two hexanol today, I need either one hexene or two hexene. And I see that on this list. So that top one, it doesn't, let, it doesn't stay there when I move the mouse, but that top structure on the blackboard is one hexene. So let's go see if I could find that here. So there's cyclo, uh, one methyl cyclohexene. Notice when I hover over it, it tells me the title. There's one styrene. There's one or three, three dimethyl one butene, and there's one hexene. Bingo, that's the one I need. But what do I add it to? So we're gonna keep looking around. Notice there's a syringe that pops up as soon as I hover over it. That's because it's a liquid and I need to withdraw a measured amount of the liquid. Um, but there's no, you know, it, that part's kept pretty simple in this lab. You don't have to calculate measurements or um, observe those kind of measurements. It's going to be assumed that you have the stoichiometric ratio uh, properly measured in order to continue with the lab because I mean in reality that's more of a general chemistry um, skill to measure things stoichiometrically so it's kind of an assumed knowledge at this point. Okay so look down here these are solvents that are possible for the alkene hydration and so you want to collect uh, choose the right solvent and we also want to choose any other reagents that are down here that we need. And let's just keep exploring before I start. There's the lab notebook, and I cautioned you to kind of keep that open. I really don't need this instruction window, but this is the lab notebook. And remember that on my clipboard, it's been a while, but hopefully it still remembers, and I'm gonna push uh, Control or Command V, and I hope that it pasted everything from that first uh, question on the quiz, and it did. So it says open your Beyond Lab, lab Notebook. So I would, that could be a huge time saver so that you know what notes you should be taking in order to insert that uh, data into the quiz when you're done. And so notice has all of the stuff that I'll be looking for in the quiz. So um, you'll wanna fill that out as you go. That's like filling out a lab notebook except for the fact that you're typing it instead of writing it. And so um, don't forget you wanna save this as you go and it does not save as a Word file or something convenient like that. It saves as a .bk file which you can't reopen unless you're in Beyond Labs. So you might wanna copy and paste it into something like Word or Google Sheets. So this is save. But just so you can actually save it again, um, you know, I might, I'll go ahead and save it because just so if I open it and find it, um, I'll save it in my spring 2020. I've done this before, so I'll replace that one. Edit, you can add new pages and new sections. So I recommend you have one big long lab notebook or at least sections of a lab notebook just to keep it organized so you don't have to scroll through tons of pages. You can delete pages and remove sections as well. Um, instructions were here for whatever experiment you loaded. Sometimes they're nice enough to show up right there and then there's help that will help load um, the user manual for you. Another way to get to the help is this little service bell. We'll load that same menu for you. So I do recommend having the lab notebook open. It will close when you start doing other things. So you just have to click on it again and it'll remember what you had typed in it. Now, a few other things to note. This is our little an an analytical section. So we have a, a proton NMR. We're gonna get to proton NMR soon. So I'm gonna ask you to ignore that step for today. Uh, so you skip any request to take a proton NMR. Uh, mass spec, we're not doing yet either. But look, there's the melting point apparatus. So if we had isolated a solid, that's what we would use. Here's their TLC chamber to check the progress of a reaction and monitor the purity. Here's our, this actually looks kind of similar to the ones we have in the lab, uh, the FTIR. So you can get an infrared spectrum. And so that's really useful. And you will be doing that today. Here's what would the contents of, you know, what you would have found in your organic glassware drawer. So there's a condenser. There is a separatory funnel and there's the distillation apparatus. This is our heating source, the heating mantle. So we, most reactions require heat. 
So we're gonna use the heating mantle and that brown stuff at the bottom is actually sand. So it has a heating coil in it and it plugs in and it'll warm up a round bottom flask because if you imagine taking our round bottom flask and putting it straight onto a hot plate, since it's spherical, only a single point would touch the hot plate and it would not get warm. So a heating mantle kind of hugs the bottom of the um, round bottom flask so that the ideally all surfaces of the solvent are kind of embraced by that heating mantle. And then sand is added to fill the void so that there's no air, which will not allow um, efficient heat transfer. Sand would allow much more efficient heat transfer from the heating mantle to the flask to the solution. So, and there's a cork ring to set down your round bottom flask since they will fall over since they're round. And um, so we'll, I think we kind of explored those our ring stand. And if we mess up at any point, it's okay. You just restart and that's clear the lab right there. So we'll, we will note reaction times and uh, we will have um, things that we can add to our flask. So remember I wanted to add the hexene and it's a syringe and my round bottom flask is down there next to the lab notebook. So I'm gonna bring that over here. And notice there's a little um, red looking plug at the top of that, that's a septum, a rubber septum. The needle can pierce that septum and deliver the liquid in there. And this, the needle itself is graduated or the syringe itself is graduated so it can measure out the liquid we need. And the septum just keeps additional air from getting out. So if we were being, if we had really, um, you know, sort of picky reaction conditions where we were working with air sensitive compounds or water sensitive compounds, then it's really important to keep the septum on and we probably would have flushed this with an inert gas to get any of the air out and replace it with an inert gas. So that's, that's what could be going on in there. Uh, so now I have, when I hover over my flask, the blackboard tells me what I've added. And so I knew I needed to add hexene um, just because that's what I had figured out as my starting material. But if you shouldn't really go much further until you've referred back to your sheet. So it's telling you to go ahead and add um, alkene hydration, use the available reagents, identify the appropriate starting material. So that was hexene for me and add it to the round bottom flask. Now add water as a solvent and drag the flask to the stir plate on the bench. So that would be the end of step one. I'm gonna go back to do step one, finish step one. So now I'm gonna add water. They told me water is my solvent and it kind of snaps into place when it's ready to add. Hover over, I see water on the blackboard now. Take it to the stir plate. This gets blacked out. So now we can move on. So if you don't follow this in the right order, it actually will not work and you just have to start over. You just say clear lab and start over. The reaction just won't progress and you would see that TLC didn't change or the IR didn't look right. Um, and then you realize, oh, I forgot to add something possibly. So just follow this instructions carefully, but if you have to start over, it doesn't matter. I've actually intentionally picked some of the wrong paths just to see what it does out of curiosity. And um, you know, it does exactly what it should, which is not work. So uh, the round bottom flask contains the starting material, should be on the stir plate, and the content should be visible on the chalkboard. From the group of reagents found on the bench, select the correct reagents to synthesize the target co compound and add it to the flask on the stir plate. So we know that this is also leaving some uh, conceptual information up to the student to identify. So um, once again, I am walking you through this one, but in the future, you have to be up to speed on that lecture material in order to do the reaction that day. So to do alkene rehydration, we've learned from lecture that water is not enough. We're gonna need an acid catalyst and sulfuric acid is one of the favorites there. So I need to add sulfuric acid and so will you in your version uh, today. So we put that in there, sulfuric acid. Now I have all the reagents I need, and now I wanna heat the reaction. So I'm gonna take my heating mantle and put it under there. It's like a little round bottom cozy. <laughs> and uh, then you're going to take the condenser. Now, why do we need a condenser? If we were to heat a liquid and just let it boil, then we're, first of all, we're heating a closed system. Not okay, but let's, uncap let's say we uncapped it, um, and then we let it boil. Then we'd lose all of our solvent as vapor. To the atmosphere. We don't want that either because then it would dry. Let's just do that. You'll see what happens. So what I can do is let the reaction go. Look what's on the board. It's, it, tell, it, it progresses and I'm going to accelerate the clock. Oh, I had an explosion. I heated a closed system. Not a good idea. Okay, so I have to start over because the glass was broken. But the good news about starting over is you get faster. So here's hexene. I'll show you a little shortcut now. Double click, now it's in the flask. 
Double click the water, now it's in the flask. Hover the flask, make sure it has hexane water. Double click, now it's where it's supposed to be. Now, let's try this again. The reason we don't want to heat a closed system is because we're going to have no way for the built up of pressure as we increase the heat um, to be relieved. So we can just put in the condenser, but ooh, look, I forgot something. Well, we'll see the consequence of forgetting something. I'm gonna put in the condenser and I'll realize I forgot sulfuric acid. I can't go back. I can try to add sulfuric acid and oh man, look at that. It let me add it through the top, I got lucky, okay? If you can't go back, you have to just start over. I actually just discovered that you could do that, so that's cool. Now, I'm going to consider heating this and let's see what happens. So I can accelerate the clock. I'll say, let's go, let's go 10 minute intervals instead. Notice a new, a new um, product is showing up here. Let's go an hour. Oh, it exploded. So you, first of all, you gotta be careful with the time intervals. Second of all, I still had a closed system and I still heated it. What is the condenser supposed to do? The condenser is supposed to allow any solvent vapor that is evaporating to come up and get cooled by the water circulating from these hoses and allowing that, once that vapor is cooled, to drip back down as liquid so that it doesn't escape as vapor to the air. But some of it will still um, escape slightly as vapor and increase the pressure, and then we have a closed system that is increasing in pressure and thus the explosion once again. So clear lab. Now we'll do this fast again. Hexene, water, add to the round bottom. They're both there. Let's add also sulfuric acid. That didn't go, that went. Now let's add our condenser. Let's add our heating mantle. Now here is how we relieve that pressure so we don't have to start over again. And to, this is hooked up to a nitrogen tank and we will pierce the septum. What, let it snap kind of in place, there it goes. Pierce the septum and any built up of positive pressure flow can come out here um, or we can actually flush it with nitrogen gas. And so it will equilibrate with what it needs to. It's the important thing is it has an outlet. So now we have some way to vent the gas that's for building up. So before going too much further, uh, in other words, before heating, I would like you to take a TLC. So see a little TLC comes out of the chamber and that just voila, does a TLC. It has nothing there. Look, it's not true though. We actually have three things there. We have hexane, water, sulfuric acid. Remember that the TLC um, really only works the, if you're using the UV active, uh, you know, property of molecules that we can um, observe how they absorb UV light. It doesn't work on some small molecules that don't have enough um, alternating double and single bonds, which is what's called conjugation. And so that doesn't allow the energy, be, energy to be low enough to be uh, absorbed into the UV range. And so that will observe that that's possible um, with some molecules that we will not see that they're UV active. So clearly this, none of these are UV active, so they're not showing up on TLC. It doesn't mean they're not there. So we will save this and save. Okay, I hit, I hit save twice. Let's look in our lab notebook. That's where they went. So go down here to the bottom of where we were already writing. My TLCs are down there. So you can get them back. And I accidentally had another one. So you could erase that one if you, if that, uh, you know, is annoying to have two of the same. Um, and then you can put a title next to it. So that could be your starting TLC. And so that's the start of the reaction. Uh, it might even be better to add another page for your TLC. So that could be your TLC page. So I can do one more just to make sure I have it where I want it. So let's leave our lab notebook open and do that. And it didn't show up. Let's do it again. There it is. Save and okay, it should disappear. Go back to our lab notebook. Our TLC is there. And so that could be right next to it. You could change the title so that you know which TLC it is because you're gonna do a total of three TLCs in this lab. So. Um, then you're going to be ready. That's the start. There's nothing happening. Let's heat the reaction. And note the reaction time. So you'll write that as your start time. Now you can accelerate. I've been messing with the clock, so it's kind of off now. But you can accelerate your reaction time. Um, 
to let it go. So take a TLC again, maybe after 10 minutes. Look at what just happened. Our blackboard changed what was on, uh, what, what was it, the composition of that round bottom flask. Let's see what that TLC would look like. Now that's different. This is our starting material. This is our um, reaction mixture. We finally have something UV active. That must be, since we know that hexene, water, and sulfuric acid is not UV active, that must mean hexanol is UV active. So let's save that and say okay. Then go in here and our TLC, and then we'll write a comment that this was after 10 minutes. Okay, so now that's two of the three TLCs that you need. Now we're gonna try to get the reaction to completion. How do we know when it's done? Well, you can experiment. Let's see, I'm gonna get this out of here, there we go. You can experiment with reaction times. So let's try an hour. Now look what happened. We have no more starting material, no more hexene. We have only sulfuric acid and water. So that means I must be done. So we're gonna move on to the other part of the lab and uh, which we could take a TLC, by the way, to confirm that. So let's take one more TLC. This could count as your last TLC, or you could actually do it after workup, but either way. Now look at that. Uh, our spot got bigger, and uh, we had no other spots to compare it to in this case, but you might have a starting spot if your um, original compound was UV active. So every lab's a little different. You sometimes have a starting spot, you sometimes don't. In this lab, the one I'm doing as an example, happens to have one that's not UV active, but the one that you do might have one. So pay attention to that, the possibility of having more than one spot for sure. And actually I think it's more helpful when there's more than one spot. So I'm gonna say, save, okay. And then I'm going to um, put that as our reaction stop time. And I did an hour and 10 minutes. So we could call that 70 minutes. And that's when I'm gonna stop the reaction because I could see there's no more starting material present. So how do I stop the reaction? Well, I'm gonna have to go back to my worksheet and get some help with that. So I've done all of these steps. I've, this is telling me how to assemble everything. That was step two. I stirred it. I monitored with TLC. I saw that the product had formed. I saw that the starting material was gone. I advanced the laboratory time. I saved my TLC plates to the lab notebook. And now it says it's complete based on TLC. So I'm gonna work up, drag and drop the separatory funnel, and we're gonna do a water workup. Sometimes it's aqueous, uh, aqueous basic, sometimes it's aqueous acidic, and this is just plain old water. So those are our three options. You're gonna add it to the separatory funnel, extract the organic layer, and put it on the cork ring. And then that's our target compound uh, isolated for the purposes of completing this lab and analyzing. So we'll be ready to analyze at that point. So in other words, let's repeat those instructions. Drag the separatory funnel. Oh, look at that, it's like magic. And then we're going to add our workup options. Remember I told you it's either aqueous acidic, aqueous basic, or just water. So we were told to use just water. And look, at, pay attention to the chalkboard. Now notice that acid disappeared. So if we were doing a flow chart, which I'm not asking you to do this time, but um, you would notice that the, the acid went into the aqueous layer. So now we have only uh, these two. And so I'm going to take off my organic layer and notice it nicely puts it in a little round bottom flask for me. And there it is. Okay, so there's my isolated compound. It's ready for analysis. You could do one more TLC just to see that everything looks good. And you could save it or not as long as you've got, have a third TLC that matches that you could choose to just uh, stick with the other one. All right, so now we're going to, we've done that step. Let's go back to the worksheet to see what's next. You wanna answer these questions as you go so you're not losing that information. And don't forget to save or at least copy and paste information from your lab notebook. And now, so starting material solvents reagent formed, how long did it take? So you're looking at reaction times. You're gonna have to measure the RF and I'll show you how to do that for in your TLCs for starting materials and products. Since our starting material had no spot on the TLC, you put none. It doesn't have an RF if it doesn't exist on the TLC. But our product certainly had a spot, so we will do that. <clears throat> You're asked to write a mechanism for the reaction. Once again, refer to the lecture where I walk through that mechanism um, step by step. 
Now for your IR, you are asked to import all uh, this information into a data table. So you're not turning this workshop sheet in. This information is duplicated in the Canvas quiz. So you will enter it in there. There's actually a table already provided in the Canvas quiz, so you will enter that in. So now we have not done that step yet though. So to collect an FTIR, click on the FTIR spectrometer to the right and drag your um, salt plate to the flask on the bench. The window containing the spectrum will show, will appear. So let's go to the IR, bring this window back. Here's the IRR, and out comes salt plate, which is what holds our sample. And we're gonna take it from there. And it's going, that's gonna be the act of taking the IR. So this is the IR of two hexanol. Actually, it looks beautiful. That's exactly what it should look like. If I took it too soon, it would look wrong if I didn't take it at the right time. So it's this pretty smart program to uh, be able to work that out. So notice this big broad OH peak. So I would put that in my table, the OH stretch. How would I assign the peak? I would look right down the middle and see where that landed on the x-axis and approximate. So it looks like it's about 3,500. Um, and then notice that right around the 3,000 line, we have our um, SP3CHs and we have some more um, fingerprint region here, which you don't have to do. But if you look at the bonds I expect to see in 2-hexanol, I would not identify a CC stretch. Those, don't, those aren't IR active. I would identify CH stretches. I would identify OH stretches, and I would identify CO stretches. COs appear, um, they're kind of usually twins, so they might be these two. They're around 1,000 to 1,200. Uh, so you can identify those three bonds in my case. Um, and so I'm not going to list what every single peak is, only the ones that actually confirm product formation. And so that would also be part of my discussion, that I confirm that I formed the product because the IR um, supported that by having the correct functional groups listed. Now, to be honest, I think their peaks are a little off because I have a CH stretch and the 3000 line, that should be over here. So I'm not too pleased with that. We'll probably have to be a little flexible with what's showing up here. Um, and then this is a little high for OH stretch. So it feels like this is shifted a little far over uh, for, you know, compared to what most scales would show it as. Um, but so be a little flexible. It looks like it's plus, plus uh, maybe an extra hundred um, nanometers or wave numbers to the left. Okay, so we will save it. It will show up in our lab notebook, but if you're worried about it, I'd even screenshot that. And that way you don't have to go through the experiment all the way to the end to get this IR again. But that is the right IR. So if your numbers are slightly off, I wouldn't stress too much. I would try to use the generic approximation. So you finished the lab, congratulations. You need your lab notebook. You need to copy and paste all of the information that you were typing and observing along the way. So um, some, if you missed anything, do it, you know, enter it while it's fresh, save it, and then go paste it into the Canvas quiz and complete the Canvas quiz post lab questions. You'll be asked um, the same questions that are in the worksheet, only in the Canvas form, and then you'll be asked for a discussion, uh, just like our previous lab reports. So make the discussion similar to that. Okay, so now it's gonna be time to wrap up the lab and get ready to do the quiz. So you have made it this far, you're almost to the end of the worksheet, you have um, collected your IR and listed the important peaks, and then you are gonna skip this one today. So no proton NMR spectra. Um, we are going to learn how to collect those and analyze them next week, uh, but for now, we're not going to do it for this experiment. So, um, so stop there, you're not required to do the proton NMR. Uh, after the proton NMR, there are a couple of questions. This is kind of like what you're asking in your discussion. So with, it says the IR uh, you measured and recorded in the tables, confirm that you've synthesized the target compound, explain. I ask you that in Canvas, so you once again don't have to print this out and write in it unless you find that particularly helpful. So I'm gonna go back to Canvas just so we can see what's expected before we wrap up. So go back to the online labs and um, this one is the first assigned Beyond Labs. So let's get that a minute to load. There we go. Uh, so this was the instruction sheet. You can go through and make sure you satisfied all of that. We did the, the Beyond Labs uh, activity. We made sure we took lots of notes and saved some screenshots. That means you're ready to do the quiz. 
So you can go over to the next over here, or you can go back and find it. So there's a next button right there. All right, so let's go back to the quiz and see what's required. So this is just a preview, but um, it's gonna be published when you start the lab. So question one was the only one we really spent some time looking at because that had all of your lab notebook data. So if you were keeping a lab notebook by hand, you, would sh you should have collected all this data. And this is where you enter it. So you can mostly cut and paste it. The table has been provided, so you um, can actually fill out the table. And if you are feeling iffy about how to assign it, use page 209 in the course guide as your reference for what peaks belong where. And so now um, you're going to be asked for a screenshot of your TLC uh, at, at three points before you started the reaction after 10 minutes and after and then you're going to be asked a few questions about it so once again it might be good to read through the quiz questions before you start the lab just so you know what to expect and what to be looking for um, so these are all tlc questions then you're asked to do the rf so how are you going to do the rf uh, measure it so remember going back to uh, last week's lab with the tlc in order to calculate the rf you had to measure the distance of the solvent front Okay, so I'm going to go back to the Beyond Labs and go find my lab notebook, TLC. So here's the last one I took. Uh, so I'm going to have to get the RF of that. And um, where's my lab notebook? It's over here. So this is the one at 70 minutes. Okay. So I need, um, in order to get the RF, I need two values for that spot. I need from the starting point measured to the center of the dot. And then I need the um, distance from the starting point to this end point, which is this finish line, the solvent front. So there's a couple ways you could do this. You could just, easiest way might just be to find a ruler around the house and hold it up to your screen and record all those measurements. If you don't have a ruler around the house, you can get one online. And so I've done, uh, I've used these online rulers. I'll put a link to this. Um, so it's, I just Googled free online ruler. And this is one that you can actually just move around and uh, it's a relative measurement, so it doesn't even matter how precise you are as long as you um, are carefully measuring both one. And notice it says do control and drag to rotate. So I'm going to position this here so that I could do that. So I have to hold down control and um, it's gonna let me kind of move this around. So now I'm gonna click to let it go and then I'll do it again to rotate it. I'm trying my best to get it parallel to an edge so that I know that it's not too crooked. Uh, it's pretty good. So I click again and then it lets me let it go. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to position that ruler from this browser window so that I just loaded this in Chrome and I'm going to drag it over to the edge of the browser window and Maybe I'll rate it later. I didn't see that happen before. And I'm going to use the metric side. Well, it, actually, it is a metric ruler. Um, it has the centimeters and millimeters. I'm going to report it in that. That's pretty much the standard. And I'm going to put that next to the TLC. And so, like I said, it's all relative. Like I could start my zero right there. And But you do need to record, pay attention to sig figs. So notice I have my zero here. And... It would be about nine point, get to here, would be 9.7. And that's the line tells me it's 0.7. There's a, there's a calibrated line that says it's 0.7 centimeters. So 9.7 are the known sig figs, the certain ones. The uncertain one is what would be in between. So if it was in between two lines, you would call it 9.75. But since it's not in between, I can actually probably reliably connect it to a line. I'd call that 9.70. So be careful with sig figs. So you do have to add that uh, what you know plus one more. So 9.70 is my solvent front. And now to see what it, how it traveled. That's my denominator, the solvent front. My numerator is the center of this, this dot down to the origin line. So that's three point, that big line is five. I'd say 3.7-ish. So the RF value is 3.7 divided by 3.70 or 3.75, depending on maybe to hold up a piece of paper to get a good read on that. Um, I actually think it's more like 
3.65. So maybe 3.65 divided by 9.70. That is the RF for this spot. So if you have six spots, you have six RFs to report. Okay, so that is going to be asked of you in your canvas to enter your RF values for the, the TLC. Now, let's see if I can go back to that. Let's see, I'll walk you through the last little bit. So that's how you do the RF part portion of it. And then you're going to draw the complete mechanism on a separate sheet of paper. If you really want to, you can do it in one of those computer drawing software programs, but that's a lot of work. Um, I find it not necessary unless you're do it, trying to use it for a presentation. So um, that's where there's a file upload. Do it as a JPEG or PDF or something like you did for your mechanism workshop. There's a couple theoretical questions from lecture about that reaction. So answer those. Screenshot of the IR, that's from the lab, the Beyond Labs. A question about reflux. Um, theory and then finally a discussion just like you would have in your lab report use your RF values use your IR peaks to discuss how you can confirm that your product did in fact form and it's worth mentioning if you had to start over um, you know what made you realize that you had to do that so that way it's extra confirmation that you were more certain that your product did form at the end so once your discussion's done, you'll be ready to submit the quiz. So once again, you're going to get all your information from Mostly Beyond Labs, this video, uh, which isn't over yet. There's still, um, I've got a little surprise real life action after this, where you can see some of the students' um, reflexes in action. I'm happy that I managed to film those. And um, there's one question about that on your post-lab quiz. So do kind of keep going on this video to watch that part because that'll kind of tick off that requirement in your quiz. Um, so, but otherwise it's coming, the rest of the requirements in the quiz are coming from um, either the lecture portion from Alkeens or the lab that you did in Beyond Labs. So kind of toggle between those sources to work through it. And i um, anxious to see how everyone likes the lab client and then let us know if you have any problems and hopefully everyone can kind of pitch in with their experiences. Um, so don't hesitate to create a thread on that. Hope you have fun. Okay, so before you run off to do things virtually, I want you to see what it looked like in real life. This is a student setup from Pierce in our own labs for a reflux of a reaction. And so since reflux is one of the new concepts you're learning in this lab, it was just brushed over so quickly in that virtual lab, but it's not um, super straightforward. It's the first time you're encountering it. So I want to pause and t take a minute to look at that. And you're gonna have a couple post lab questions on that. Um, because that's going to be an important skill to do in the future. So notice this, instead of a heating um, mantle that's sort of that cloth uh, shape that's in the Beyond Labs, we have a more rigid, um, sturdy, solid sort of one, but they're both great. And the sand is filling that void so that the heat can be transferred from the heating mantle through the sand to the solution. Underneath it is our stir plate, so we use those round ones. We have a stir bar in there that's magnetic, so it can um, spin and stir our reaction mixture. And it's heating, so we don't want it to evaporate. So we have our condenser on here, and notice it has two tubes in there. The outer jacket um, and is separate from the inner jacket. So inside is where the vapor could travel up, um, but in between the inner, inner tube and the outer tube, that's the jacketed uh, sort of term, uh, the water is free to circulate around that inner tube contained within the outer tube. So the water comes in from the faucet and fills up, circulates, and out through the top and over to a drain. And so that, um, that circulating water cools the surface of the glassware so that as a vapor that's hot from the solvent comes up and attempts to escape in the vapor form, it hits cold glass turns back into a liquid and recondenses and drips back in. So when you see that bubbling and dripping, um, that's the reflux, that cycle of it coming back up and dripping back down. And you might hear that's kind of similar to what's happening in acid reflux, right? It's kind of coming up and going back down. So that reflux is this cycle of it going up and down. Uh, that way it does not escape. Notice we don't stopper our top because uh, the reactions we're doing were not air sensitive. So um, if we heated it too high, it would escape. And so you have to maintain a constant temperature. And so let's see, we can play. So the 
vapor there. You can see the vapors gathering there. You can actually visualize it. That's the flow of water. So they did a piggyback method, which is to let their drain be into another student's uh, opening and then come back out top. So that student's got her vapor gathering up there and um, the student has his or, his, his or her vapor gathering up there. Okay, so here's another let students lab setup. I took this just last semester. I remember thinking it was a nice example of a nicely set up reaction. So I um, took it that there's a few things that are worth pointing out though. So notice the sand is below the liquid level. Um, so technique wise, we would add enough sand to completely uh, match the liquid level because that part of the solution is not getting heated. Um, it's getting heated much more thoroughly down below the sand level. So the sand's supposed to transfer the heat from this heating mantle. So this surface is very hot and you need to transfer that heat to the flask. And so it's not getting heated all the way. So that's one issue um, that's going on there. It's clamped, so it's sturdy. It's got the water coming in through the bottom and I wanted to get a zoomed in video of this. So I'm glad I took these last semester. I was just in a mood to do that. So it came, comes in handy now. So notice the condensation happening there, right there. You can kind of see it. And there's the setup. We have this intermediate power control. Um, I hope it's adjusted. Power apply below the heat. Be overdone. So notice it's condensing back there. So here's an example of a reaction that was actually done just last semester as well. And um, it's well underway to being, uh, you know, having refluxed for a while. So a couple things to notice, look, this particular student, the sand is kind of better encasing the, you know, could use a little more here, but at the same time, you kind of like to see what's going on in the solution. So it, you don't want it to be obscured and bury your flask where it'd be at the top level, but um, you know, it's getting closer to the right sand level, probably suggest a little higher sand level, to be honest, just because this part's not getting heated as evenly. However, it still seems to be doing the job because look at, it's clearly a hotter flask um, at this point. We see that there's been lots of condensation. So notice that the solvent vapor has um, been heated to an adequate temperature to allow solvent to evaporate and hit this cold glass and start condensing back down. And so we get what's called um, you know, these are hard things to put, pick up virtually, which is why I wanted to point out a few real life pictures. Um, the students are always in search of their reflux ring, which is the spot where it stops condensing. So after this point, there's no more condensation observed. And that's because um, if the reflux ring gets too high up the condenser, then what's to stop it to actually uh, evaporate or continue to vaporize right out the top? So you're, it's a sign that you're heating it too vigorously, usually if the reflux ring kind of passes the halfway point. And so, um, you know, these aren't things you'll see virtually, but I just wanted you to point it out because these are things, practically speaking, we want to keep in mind. So this is that water coming in, circling the jacketed um, inner tube to cool it down. And so let's play this video. So, yeah, this is just a reminder because it's been so hard for students to do it. I made this video to kind of highlight this reflux ring. So the reflux ring right here. Okay, so I'll stop that here. Um, refer back to this video if you feel you need to um, have help with the post-lab questions or to do even the future week's labs because they're gonna follow a similar style um, from here on out. So um, in terms of turning in the report, it's gonna be due just before the next lab starts and we're gonna kind of keep that consistent from this point on now that we have a predictable kind of software platform to work with. So, um, so try to get this done ideally sometime throughout the day Monday and then submit your quiz before you could work on it all week, submit it before you start the next lab um, a week from today.